Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the second episode of the True Tales to Tell in the Dark portion of Dark Softly Tales podcast. I'm your host, Mav. And thanks for hanging out with me this evening. How's everyone doing tonight? Well, it's May already. And we are on our 26th episode. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Tonight's topic... Mermaids. Sirens of the Sea. Divas. The Shining Ones. Sea Nymphs. Nereids. They enchant. They lure. They tease. They are the essence of mystery, imagination that rises deep from the depths of the proverbial ocean. The ocean is where we may see them, but that is not where they began. If we think of truth springing from fresh springs of the mountaintops, flowing into rivers, which we will call lore, then that truth and lore flowing ultimately into the ocean, intermingling with truth, lore, mythology. That's what we all call story. The ocean of story. Before there is story, there is truth. And without truth, there is no story. Tonight, we will be examining the lore of the mermaid from true accounts by seafaring captains from the Age of Discovery the lore of the ancient tales to fairy tales. What does the mermaid represent in our human consciousness? Why does she call to us through stories and is she something to be feared or embraced? I also wanted to examine this from a feminine point of view as well. We will be exploring all this tonight and also over the next few weeks as we dive into the lore of mermaids. In the southwest corner of Egypt, within the Sahara Desert, there is a rocky ridge that rises out of the earth about a thousand feet. It is called the Gulf Kiber, which translated means the Great Barrier. Inside the rocky ridge, there is a cave with well-preserved 7,000-year-old drawings. There are drawings of giraffes, hippopotamuses, humans, humans paddling in water, humans hunting fish in the water. And then it gets a little weird. It depicts beings in the water that are half human, half fish, holding spears and also hunting fish. But then it progresses to the half fish, half human beings at war with the humans on land. It is called the cave of swimmers. The catch? There is no water for hundreds of miles in either direction. Wednesday, January 9th, 1493. Christopher Columbus writes in his diary entry... The Admiral made sail at midnight, with the wind southeast and shaped an east-northeast course, arriving at a point named Punta Roja, which is 60 miles east of Monte Cristi, an 
anchored under its lee three hours before nightfall. He did not venture to go out at night, because there are many reefs, until they are known. Afterwards, if, as will probably be the case, channels are found between them, the anchorage, which is good and well sheltered, will be profitable. The country between Monte Cristi and this point where the Admiral anchored is a very high land, with beautiful plains, the range running east and west, all green and cultivated, with numerous streams of water, so that it is wonderful to see such beauty. In all this country, there are many turtles, and the sailors took several when they came on shore to lay their eggs at Monte Cristi, as large as a great wooden buckler. On the previous day, when the Admiral went to the Rio de Ordo, he saw three mermaids, which rose well out of the sea. But they are not so beautiful as they are painted, though to some extent they have the form of a human face. The Admiral says that he has seen some at other times in Guinea. World War II Japanese soldiers were stationed in the K Islands, which is located in Indonesia. The soldiers began to report strange sightings. They claimed they saw a half-woman, half-fish the size of a small child leaping out of the water playfully. It wasn't just one soldier reporting this, but many. It wasn't until the soldiers were exploring a lagoon one day that an amphibious, human-like creature leapt up from the water onto a nearby rock. It's reported that the creature made a gurgling, burp-like noise which the soldiers took as unfriendly. So being humans, they decided to throw rocks at it until they noticed another one swimming in the water toward them. At that point, the soldiers decided to retreat. They went back and immediately reported this to Sergeant Taro Harabo. Mr. Harabo decided to investigate. He went to the locals and asked about the creature. The villagers said the creature was an orang ikan. Orang means human, ikan means fish. Occasionally, one of the creatures would wash up or get caught in the nets of the fishermen. The chief promised that if this happened, he would inform the sergeant. So one day soon after, the villagers inform Sergeant Harabo that a body of an orang ikan had washed ashore. The sergeant and soldiers rushed over to see what the creature truly was. Here, Sergeant Harabo finally witnessed the creature himself. What he saw took his breath away. He fully examined the creature and here is a direct quote from his report. Roughly four foot nine inches tall, pinkish skin, human looking face and limbs, spikes along its head, and a mouth like a carp. When Taro Harabo returned to Japan, he encouraged scientists to go to the K Islands and study the Orang Ikan, but they never did. Now, we couldn't have this episode without mentioning the Nereids from Greek and Roman mythology. 
nymphs of the sea, daughters of the mighty Poseidon. But not all accounts of the Nereids and Tritons are fiction. Pliny the Elder lived from about 24 to 79 AD. He was an author, a naturalist, and a philosopher. He was also a naval and army commander in the Roman Empire, and good friends with Emperor Vespasian. Pliny the Elder writes this account of his findings in his book, Natural History, Chapter 4, and you can find this link in the show notes. There was seen and heard within a certain cave a triton sounding a shell, and that he was known by his form. And it is not false that there is such a creature as a Nereid, only their body is rough with scales, even in those parts where they possess a human form. For such a female being was beheld on the same shore, and the neighboring inhabitants heard its moaning from a distance when it was dying. Also, a governor of Gaul, under Divus Augustus, wrote that many of these Nereids were seen dead upon the shore. I possess authors, illustrious in the equestrian order, who testify that in the ocean near Gades they saw a sea man, in the whole body perfectly resembling a man that in the night season he would come aboard their boats, and on whatever part he sat, he weighed it down, so that if he continued there for any long time, he would even sink it. just a few accounts of many that have been documented throughout time. Along with truth, we will find mythology. There's a lot of places we can look for these myths, but I'd like to focus on the ones that we're more familiar with. These days, we often use the words mermaids, sirens, sea nymphs interchangeably, but these are each very different creatures. Mermaids are the romanticized European version of the merwoman, mysterious, enchanting, playful. The word mermaid is often used interchangeably with the word siren. If you think of polarity, day and night, order and chaos, land and sea, man and woman, Republicans and Democrats, haha, white and black, good and evil. There's two sides to every coin. So if the mermaid represents beauty, truth, strength, then the siren would be the flip side of the coin. She is the spirit of drowned women rising up for vengeance on sailors. She is the trickster luring men into the sea with her beauty, then drowning them in the cold waters. In the olden times, sirens were also thought to have wings. And to be honest, the pictures I've seen of them, they look kind of harpy. I did some digging around and discovered that in very ancient myths, mermaids were associated with divas. Divas are also called the shining ones. Devil is another word for divas. You may recall that Lucifer in the Bible was called the morning star or light bringer. The research I did on this brought me to the Sanskrit sacred text, which I, quite frankly, dropped down a rabbit hole. And I wasn't sure if I'd ever be seen again, but it's a good thing I brought a rope. And I climbed my way up out from the abyss. And I'll tell you what. I don't know what to think of it all. 
the reference to the Shining Ones, I was able to reference to the fourth dimension. Einstein called the fourth dimension the dimension of time. He had various theories on it, which we won't go into here. You're very welcome. But it is said that the Shining Ones exist in the dimension of time. And they are mere reflections of ourselves as we gaze upon them in the water. If we gaze upon them with the lower qualities of mankind, lust, greed, desire, jealousy, or fear, that is what is reflected back to us. And that will bring about death. A drowning, if you will. If we gaze upon the Shining Ones with purity in our hearts from the higher realms, then we will see beauty, truth, love, imagination, justice, and we will be met with our heart's desire. I've spent the last few weeks in preparation of this episode, but not just for this audience, but out of my own curious drive. I've read dozens and dozens of mermaid tales, watched mermaid horror movies, read true historical accounts. And what stands out to me the most is the polarity between the masculine and the feminine. Think of the mermaids as representing chaos and man representing order. Man is lured by the beauty of chaos, the danger of it, but ultimately tries to destroy it because he is afraid. From the other end, mermaids fall in love with man, the order that he represents, but she has a tendency to give up what makes her beautiful in the first place, that wild danger of her, her voice, her home, which is the ocean and her fins. She does this to please man, but ultimately, this is destructive for both of them. She remains silent, and he remains in fear. So one of the things I started exploring is how these two entities could be together without compromise on either end. How can trust and courage take the place of fear, silencing, control, compromising? How can this be a love story with a happy ending? Which started me thinking about my own life, my own relationships. How had my light been dimmed? What have I compromised? Did I allow myself to be silenced? So how can it work? I don't know. But what I do know is that this is a struggle between men and women for thousands of years. And I think right now, those energies are finally trying to find balance. If you look at the world around us right now, polarity is at an all-time high. Chaos is doing its thing. Order is trying to control it. How can we all find balance with each other, within ourselves? These questions led me to the story of a tale called The Mermaid Wife. There are many versions of this tale ranging from all sorts of different places. Iceland, the Shetland Island, Wales, Ireland. The gist of this story is that basically there's this guy walking down the seashore. It's a full moon night and he sees all these beautiful women dancing in the moonlight. He rushes toward them to get a better look. They see him. And then they flee to this giant pile of seal skins. They're slipping into the seal skins, jumping into the water, swimming away. And he's able to snatch a single seal skin before they're all gone. And he rushes home and he hides it somewhere outside of his house. He then turns around, rushes back, and returns to where the women were dancing. And finds the most beautiful maiden he's ever laid his eyes on. And she's wandering the shoreline, distraught and anxious. And when he asks her what was wrong, she says that she's missing her skin. And she asks if he's seen it. He is 
love struck by this woman and denies knowing where the seal skin is. He convinces her that she will never find it. And he offers to take her home to his house where he will provide and take care of her. She gives up hope and decides to go with him. The man loves her with all his heart. He just adores her. And she stays with him. And she does love him. She does the house chores. She takes care of his home. Makes his dinner. But she is cold toward him. And nights with a full moon, she goes out to the sea and talks to a great sea lion for hours. And at dawn, she returns home, sad and crying because she longs to return to the sea. The man and woman have children together. The children do not have seal skins like her, but they have webbed fingers and feet. They're capable of breathing underwater for many hours before needing to come up for air, but they cannot live in the water as the woman had. One day, the children are playing outside and they find this most beautiful seal skin They run to the mother, crying, Mama, Mama, look what we found. And the woman cries for joy. She can finally go back home. But then she also weeps, because this means that she must also leave her children. She brings them to the water. She hugs and kisses them. And somehow the man figures out what's going on, and he rushes to the shoreline, begging the woman to stay. He's crying, he's distraught, because he did love her very, very much. She slips into the seal skin and leaps into the water before he can reach her. She tells him that she loved him, too, but now it was time for her to return home. And she ducks beneath the waves and she leaves. However, it is said that her children often come into the water and visit with her, especially on full moon nights. They laugh and they play beneath the waves. She teaches them everything she knows about the sea, while their father teaches everything he knows to them about living on the land. So if we look at the story, She belonged in the sea, where it was wild and crazy, and she can be that chaos. Where the man was the order that was on land. What they created through their children was this third, it was this entity that could live on land and in water. Love is this living creation between a man and a woman, and if that is nurtured, the creation can become this medium where neither person has to compromise or lose who they are. And I think that this is where that balance is found. I bring up these thoughts for you to consider, but I by no means have any answers to them. Very quickly, there is a story I'd like to tell you before we close here. I wrote a first draft of a novel years ago when I lived in Texas called Accents. I haven't published it, or at least not yet, but the story is about a village way out in the middle of nowhere. They live in a rainforest high up in the mountaintops. And this town believes in a fable about these ants that create a scent that basically lures all the riches of the world to their nest. In this story, the village is by a waterfall that is rumored to have a mermaid that lives within it. So I started researching places in the world where this town could potentially take place. And I ended up searching through the mountains of Peru and I found an article saying that within the last decade, they discovered one of the world's largest waterfalls way up in the mountains there. It's called Gatka Falls. The indigenous tribes have known about the waterfall, but they refuse to talk about it or even go there because they believed in a mermaid who lived in the falls. And if you looked upon her, she would drown you. 
First, I was amazed that I found a town close to a waterfall where this story could potentially take place. But the mermaid story, that blew my mind. It was exactly what I was looking for. It seemed to me that every culture has its own version of half-human, half-fish that lives in the water. Sometimes the mermaids are beautiful, playful, luring, and sometimes they are sirens, calling humankind to their deaths. Whatever the case may be, I think we can all agree that there is a time and a place for mermaids, even now, even today. And I think that being open to the call of the mermaid, facing that beautiful chaos without fear, but with genuine curiosity and admiration. If we do this, we may very well find our heart's desire created in a place where land meets the sea. Thank you for listening to this special episode of True Tales That Tell in the Dark of Dark Softly Tales. We will be here next week with our first guest author story that I hope you will love as much as I do. Until then, shine bright, dark hearts.